Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome this evening. Um, thank you for turning out on a Thursday night. So, um, I, I, I'm going to talk about quantum technologies and I'm going to spend about 40 to 45 minutes going through really at the top level of quantum technologies as they exist today, really with a focus on near-term quantum technologies, so what are the ones that are nearest the market, and then also looking a bit at the ones which are furthest away from the market. So there's a real range of quantum technologies around the UK and also the world today. So um, what I've done is split the talk up into about four areas. So firstly, the quantum technologies themselves, what are they? Secondly, the applications that uh, quantum technologies can provide. Why are people thinking about using quantum technologies? Then who's doing what? Uh, a bit of what's happening in the UK and a bit of what's happening around the world because there have been some really exciting developments around the rest of the world as well as the UK. And then really, um, so, so we're engineering a quantum product at the moment. So what does it actually mean to engineer a quantum product? Um, so I'm just going to touch on that a little bit. So, a bit of audience participation, please. Here's a question. How soon do you think it will be before you'll be buying, either commercially or professionally, a quantum product? So please stick your hands up if you think it's three years. Excellent, thank you. Five years? That's rather more. 10 years? That's about the same. And 20 years? There's a few. Ah, very good. So I'd say about 30% say th uh, 5 years, 30% say 10 years, and about 15% say 3 years. So that's quite an interesting mix. There's no, of course, uh, simple answer to that. Uh, there's one simple answer, which you can buy a quantum product today, and I'll come on to those. Um, and you'll probably find a quantum product that people know today is not available even in 20 years' time um, to, to actually buy. So, um, yeah, no, no real answer at the moment. First, I want to start off with a word. So the word quantum is probably why some of you are here tonight. What is quantum? What, what does it mean? What can I do with it? Um, it's also a word that actually repels as well. So when you look at it in the business context, people think that's a, that's a bit of a scary word. Um, I don't understand what it means. Should I actually invest in something for my business um, with, a, with a new thing? So I thought I'd compare that to three other words. So if I take semiconductors, I'm quite happy with semiconductors, actually. And I imagine most people in the room are quite happy with semiconductors. If I can go and look up a part number, I can go and find the spec sheet, I can Google it, I can work out what it does, I can buy it from RS or um, Farnell, and pretty much I can go and put it into a circuit and I'll understand what it does. Uh, now, I'm trusting the designer to actually have designed that to uh, perform in the way it's supposed to perform as per the spec sheet. So I'm quite happy with semiconductors. I'm, I'm a bit less happy with cyber. So cyber, I, I don't really know what that means. If I ask anybody who's a cyber professional in the room, that could be anybody from somebody who writes software through to someone who sells corporate cyber insurance. So it, it really is a massive definition. Um, and Internet of Things is a, is a bit, bit like that as well. So it's, it's not very precise. It doesn't really help. But semiconductors and Internet of Things aren't really very scary. Um, and quantum is just unknown. But if we look at, look at semiconductors, if we go back 30 years, 40 years, then they were pretty new at that time as well. So perhaps they would have been scary um, 40 years ago. So it's just a comment on words and barriers. So quantum sl has a slight barrier to entry at the moment. And this is one of the things I'm hoping you, the audience, can help out with in the future. I've got a challenge later on in the talk to, uh, to actually help out with that. 
So first off, we're all carrying around a quantum device in our pockets at the moment. Um, mobile phones, smart watches, Fitbits, whatever you might have around you, that's actually a quantum device. It uses semiconductor band gaps from the physics of the early 1900s to the 1920s. And so we're all familiar with lasers, scanning techniques in hospitals, um, having applications in mobile phones, communications, computing, medical imaging. It's really embedded in society, and, and we really don't, don't mind about that. Um, we, we don't actually have to know that it's a quantum device. Uh, again, as an engineer, I will go look up the spec sheet for the particular chip I need to use to make a mobile phone. Uh, and I'll go and make a mobile phone. And what I will trust is that the manufacturer of that device has actually designed it properly. And he's designed it in a way that I can use the spec sheet and it will behave in the way um, I'm expecting it to behave. Now there might be some wry smiles around the, uh, around the audience where that hasn't always worked. It hasn't always worked for me either. I've had a production line stop where half the devices worked and half didn't. And when I asked the semiconductor manufacturer, he said, oops, yes, sorry about that. Um, I changed the architecture internally, but I didn't change the number on the chip. Um, so I had to get an engineer onto the line with a scope probe to find out which chips behaved in a different way to the ones that were supposed to work. So by and large, good but occasionally you have to watch out. So, first generation. Happy with the first generation? Yep. New generation. Okay, so now it gets interesting. So, um, the, the new generation is defined by two terms, superposition and entanglement. And I'll come on to those in a minute. Those haven't been used in widespread use in the first generation technologies. Um, we have a couple of luminaries. Einstein said for entanglement that was spooky action at a distance. And he said that in about 1935. So that is kind of interesting. That dates the technology. You know, this new generation of technology actually had its origins back in the 1920s and 1930s. That's when the physics was done. Um, superposition is the other one, and if you roll the two together, um, Richard Feynman said, you understand quantum technologies, you don't understand quantum technologies. Um, so don't feel too bad if you don't understand quantum technologies. I don't feel too bad either. Uh, but I do know how to use them. So that's the two terms. So what are they? So superposition, if, if we look at a state, let's say you have two state system. You can have a state of zero and a state of one. And in a classical system, it's either in one or the other. In a quantum system, you consider a device that can have multiple states simultaneously. And you only get to see whether it's an autumn one when you actually look at it, when you actually inspect the state. It then resolves itself to an auto one, but in between times, it can be anything in between. That's superposition. Entanglement is equally interesting. Entanglement, you take, the, um, you take two atomic particles and you can entangle them together and they behave as a system. You can then separate those atomic particles, and they still behave as a system. It's a technique used for quantum key distribution, which I'll come on to. Um, so when I say um, atomic particles, so what could that be? So if you take a calcium ion, um, and that's positively charged with a single valence electron in its outer shell. If you take two of them, and you entangle them, that electron can be either in spin up or spin down. And if it's in spin up on one calcium ion, it's in spin down on the other calcium ion. And if you then separate those, they'll stay the same until you inspect them. Um, so that's entanglement. 
Um, if you mess around with one of those atoms, the whole system gets destroyed. And so you can actually detect that at a different point. Now, the interesting thing is you can do that in three dimensions. Someone told me the other day that there's no reason why you can't do that in time as well. So I can't get my head around that at the moment, but I will venture that to the audience as something to, to think about. So those are the two terms, superposition and entanglement. So the question is, how can I use those in a quantum system that's going to be useful for society? OK, well, so, some people have believed that. And they put their money there. And the, the UK has been tremendous at this. The UK physics community has been brilliant at recognizing that there is opportunity here. They've been talking to physicists around the world who've also agreed that there is opportunity here. And there's also been some reasonably recent technology developments. So if you look at the top one there, um, 1997, Nobel Prize for Physics for the ability to cool and trap <coughs> excuse me, cool and trap atoms using lasers. So there's no, there's no liquid nitrogen, liquid helium in sight. You use a laser beam, you use some magnetic fields, and you can slow an atom down. Um, and as you slow an atom down, um, it cools. And you can do that to within tens of microkelvin. Some, some people actually get within uh, units of microkelvin above absolute zero. So it's a really effective te technique. And it's really not very expensive to do. You, um, you have to do other things, like make sure there aren't any other atoms about. Because um, if they bump into your wanted atom cloud, then they'll interfere with it, and you lose your, use your ability to actually have the effect you want. So let's look at what the UK government's done. So the UK government, back in 2013, started with an investment of 270 million pounds into this area. That 270 million pounds was over five years. And I've just written down there the areas it, in, it invested in. So 120 million pounds went into four university hubs, um, which are north to south, Glasgow, York, Birmingham, and Oxford. And those university hubs do different things. Um, they focus on different elements of quantum technologies. Um, so you can see there, um, Glasgow's doing enhanced imaging, uh, which I'll come on to. Um, York is doing quantum communications. Birmingham is sensors and metrology. And Oxford is network quantum information technologies. Um, so NQIT is, is what most people would call quantum computing. But um, it, it's, it's much wider than that, because we get to quantum computing architectures. Um, so those are the university hubs. They've been working very hard. They've also networked themselves extremely well with industry. Um, and you, uh, you can go along to the quantum hubs, and you can have lots of interesting conversations about uh, quantum devices. Uh, and there's some uh, really good annual reports that the quantum hubs do, which actually give you a clue as to what projects are actually, uh, are actually engaged in. Um, so other areas are uh, 50 million pounds went to Innovate UK. So uh, I'll come on to some of the projects that Innovate UK has done. Um, but they are collaborative projects with industry um, where they're, if you're a large company, they're 50-50 funded. Uh, the UK government funds 50% of the project and 50% uh, is funded by companies. Uh, training and skills. Uh, obviously, if you have a new industry, you need people to actually... Um, uh, take part in the industry and contribute towards it. So there are three centers for doctoral training uh, and three centers for quantum systems training as well uh, for that 49 million. 30 million went to DSTL and they did, they've got a, an interesting set of projects going and they've also sponsored a lot of PhDs. 29 million went to National Physical Laboratory to set up the Quantum Metrology Institute. If you're making quantum devices, then you have to have some way of a reference to measure how well they're performing. So if you're a company making a voltmeter, 
somebody calibrates your voltmeter, that voltage is calibrated all the way back to a national physical laboratory standard. The same applies to quantum devices. So if we're making a new quantum device, like a quantum key distribution device, how do you guarantee that that QKD system is actually, measure, uh, is actually performing correctly? And that's one of the things that the QMI does. Uh, and then finally, there, there are a, I think there's 14 quantum technology fellows who are in the UK, around the country, doing fellow type things. So that was the last five years. And in the autumn statement, the government announced another 315 million pounds to continue the hubs, to uh, set up two things for industry, Industry Strategy Challenge Fund, which um, uh, has, has got a, lo uh, a lot of different uses. One of those is quantum. There's also a Quantum Technologies Pioneer Fund, which awarded four contracts just before Christmas uh, on uh, four different circa five to six million pound projects uh, <coughs> to do quantum things. Uh, and then there's 35 million for a national quantum computing center. The mission statement here is important. So you could say that the first five years was all about investing in research and some outreach. The, the mission statement here, the government's very clear that the focus now is on accelerating the technologies that are in university laboratories out into use and actually getting all of us, the taxpayers, our money back that we've invested. Um, so that's a very focused statement from the government. There's a very good Science and Technology Committee report, which I've given the link to at the end of the presentation. Um, and that's well worth a read. It's about 70 pages, though, so uh, it's, it's quite an interesting read. So what are some of these quantum technologies? Um, so here's a bit of a list. It's not a complete list. Um, uh, it would take me far too long to write the complete list. Um, so we have cold atoms. So these are typically clouds of millions of atoms cooled to near absolute zero. And those atoms are very useful for motion detection. So rotation, acceleration. They can also be used for magnetic field detection. Uh, and gravity detection. Um, switching topics, um, this is a really interesting one, nitrogen vacancies. So if you take a diamond lattice, you kick one of the carbon atoms out, and you put a nitrogen atom near one of the other carbons, you end up with a vacant lattice. Um, you then shine lasers on it, and as that lattice goes into a magnetic field, the laser light is bent and changed color. So it's quite an easy thing to demonstrate because you, you waggle a, uh, a magnet over this nitrogen vacancy in diamond and the lasers change color. Uh, it's a very interesting technology. Uh, the interesting thing about it is it's room temperature. So there's no cooling inside. Um, then we, we go down the scale a bit. We go to trapped ions. So this is singular ions which are trapped and can be used for all sorts of things. Um, in fact, one is used for the current uh, UK time standard. So it's something called a cesium fountain. And there's a cesium uh, iron trapped uh, using RF modulation of lasers to actually regulate uh, the time of some hydrogen masers, which is what NPL used for um, the regular time base. And that's good for about 2 times 10 to minus 16 stability. Uh, we have SPADs, single photon avalanche devices, very sensitive imaging devices for different frequencies, superfluid gyroscopes, so superfluids, again, fluids which are, cold, which are cooled, very cold, and then you, you use the fluid behavior. And then superconducting, you can use superconducting for qubits. So those are some of the technologies. So what does an atom cloud at 30 microkelvin look like? Well, that's what it looks like. So the yellow blob there in the middle of that coil is actually a, about a million atoms which are cooled to near absolute zero. Uh, and the way you do that is with six laser beams and a, a coil to stabilize the magnetic field. 
uh, and then you can end up with a stationary atom cloud, which you can then do things with. So how do I think about quantum technologies? Um, so I divide them into four, and it's slightly different to the way the government's divided them, but that's just me. Um, so there's timing, sensing, communication security, and computing. That's how I think of quantum technologies. And what I'll do in the, in the rest of the talk is I'll take each one of those in turn, uh, and I'll look at them in a little bit of detail. Um, when we look at applications, um, here's something um, I had an intern do over the summer, um, which is looking at what the readiness of the different applications are. So if you look at the ticks in the left-hand column, these are things that are actually ready and working in labs, um, and uh, prototypes are emerging if you go one column along. So just, just rocking down the list there, atomic clocks, well, I think most engineers have come across atomic clocks before. Um, you can get all sorts of atomic clocks, and so that's got ticks all the way across, including chip scale designs. Um, optical clocks, uh, they're slightly different. Uh, so an optical clock, the best optical clocks are good for about 2 times 10 to the minus 18, um, and those are in research phase at the moment. Um, now, when you go from 2 times 10 to the minus 16 to 2 times 10 to the minus 18, you start having other problems. So 2 times 10 to the minus 18, if I move that clock that much, time actually changes on the clock due to um, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, so if you're making a clock like that, you actually have to have a gravity survey done on your lab bench to work out what the gravity is. <laughs> Sounds bonkers, but you do. <laughs> um, 2 times 10 to minus 16, another um, scientist at the NPL told me the other day, it's about the difference in age of your head to your feet. <laughs> so um, interesting things pop up. Uh, I'll talk about more about clocks in, in a minute. Then we have things to sense motion, gravity sensors, accelerometers, gyroscopes. Um, then we have an interesting one, quantum radar. So quantum radar is a thing, and it's looking at the way you can actually improve the signal-to-noise ratio of a received radar pulse. Um, and it, it's a really interesting thing, quite hard to do. Um, getting a quantum entangled RF photon is quite hard, but people are working on it. Um, magnetometers, thermometers, quantum computers, QKD, quantum key distribution, uh, quantum repeaters, um, quantum gas imaging. Um, if you image methane, for example, uh, methane responds to a different wavelength to, um, uh, to visible light but you can design a camera to actually respond to uh, image methane gas. Um, OEM MIT is, um, MIT is uh, magneto-induced tomography, so it's brain scanning. Uh, and there are prototypes of, uh, of the new brain scanning up at uh, Nottingham University. Um, Subshot noise imaging is, what it says on the tin, a really sensitive way of imaging. And then hidden object tracker, I'll come to that um, in a bit, bit of time. So I think the thing to take away from that table is there's a lot of five years, there's lots of five to ten years. So there's an awful lot of applications there which actually are within five years of people in this room working on them. So, timing. Why do I need a timing reference? Well, why is society interested in timing? It seems to be very fixated on timing. We, we all have less time, we seem to have, than 20 years ago. But um, why, is people, why are people interested in timing? So the Royal Academy of Engineering did a survey. It's quite, quite old now, so the number's probably gone up. But European reliance on GPS is 390 billion euro. So that's commerce. That's not just not just um, vans stopping somewhere and not able to navigate. Uh, this goes to your cellular phones, where cell phones have reliance on GPS for uh, timing information um, from, the, from the base stations. It goes to the banking system, where uh, 
uh, GPS is used for uh, timing synchronization on trades. Um, defense and security, obviously very interested in not only navigating but also timing. Um, and power distribution as well as the one I haven't mentioned. Um, so some of the synchronization of switching in the power industry is done by GPS devices. So I think if we just accept that society is interested in timing. But what, what kind of accuracy do I need? Um, so UK national time is 2 times 10 to minus 16. Uh, GPS is about 1 times 10 to minus 12. Um, what do I need? What do, I, what do I need for timing? What form factor do I need? And so there's a bunch of trade-offs between the accuracy of a thing and the usefulness of it in the particular application that I have. So here, here are two things which are real. So there's a, uh, there's a um, previous generation rubidium atomic clock. Consumes 10 to 25 watts. Its size is 20, 125 by 86 by 25, and it weighs about 400 grams. So in 2003-04, um, the American National Standards Institute kicked off a program which ultimately ended up in the chip scale atomic clock. So uh, that took them eight years, a magnificent piece of development um, for a brand new thing uh, using cesium, using tiny, tiny cesium components. And then what you can see there is that the, the power consumption is 120 milliwatts, so that's two orders of magnitude less. The size is about one order of magnitude less, and the weight is just, un, uh, sorry, just slightly better than one order of magnitude less. So why would I use that? Well, I can now use that in applications where I couldn't use this other thing, because the other thing's too warm, too power consuming. Um, now, it's a new technology. There are bound to be uh, issues, um, but, the advantages are plain to see from, from the spec sheet. And that's, that's something to, to remember. I can compare the spec sheet here. I'm very comfortable as an engineer. I can just look at these two things and I can say, right, I'm going to choose this one because this is a brilliant piece of technology for what I need to use now. So, the slightly scary thing about the CSAC is you can only buy it from one place. So if I design it into a system and I can't buy it anymore, then I have a bit of a problem. So uh, what the UK has done is recognize this and has actually set up a desire to have a UK um, uh, atomic clock. And there is an Innovate UK project which is currently creating, creating one of those. Um, so in five years' time, I think we'll have probably two or three of them, actually. Um, new generation of clocks in the UK. Um, the other thing is, these things currently in the research labs, I think they'll be live. Um, I think they will be heading towards being the UK standard. Uh, so that's two orders of magnitude. And they've been in research for about 10 to 15 years. So um, that's quite amazing. I, I don't know how many other things get two orders of magnitude improvement in the fundamental property in just 10 to 15 years. Uh, again, that's what fascinates me about, uh, about time. So that's timing. <coughs> now let's move to sensing. <coughs> Excuse me. Sensing includes motion sensing and, in my mind, imaging as well. So we've already mentioned gyros, accelerometers, gravimeters and gradiometers, and magnetometers, and imaging is single photon detectors. So, so this, this thing here is a magneto optic trap. And that's what a gravimeter kind of looks like, sort of sensing head of a gravimeter kind of looks like. So you can see the blue wires on there. The, the wires are actually optic fibers, which are um, uh, sending lasers into that small cloud of atoms. And I think you can vaguely see it glowing a bit purplish. And the purple glow is rubidium. Uh, it's a rubidium gas, um, which is um, stationary in the middle of that. So, let's move to accelerometers. 
So one way of doing accelerometer, and there's more than one way, is something called cold atom interferometry. Um, so how does that work? So cold atom interferometry works using superposition. Uh, and what you do is you cool your atom cloud down to your low temperature. You then separate your atoms into two superposition states. Um, you then um, let the atoms fall free. And the atoms then experience acceleration in one axis or other. You then recombine the atoms. And when you recombine the atoms, they form an interference pattern. And from that interference pattern, you can actually read out directly the acceleration that that atom cloud has been subject to. So OK, so that's brilliant. So well done, the quantum physicists. They've come up with a way of very sensitively measuring uh, uh, movement. But what does that mean to me as an engineer? So to me as an engineer, uh, I, can, I can get a very good accelerometer that's, that can measure down to 10 micro g. That's a navigation class accelerometer. My quantum gravimeter can measure down to 10 nano g. So suddenly, I have three orders of magnitude improvement uh, in the ability to resolve acceleration. So what does that mean? Well, actually, you know, the, the, the news isn't always good. So, uh, so one of the things I've got to contend with is the, the sense of bandwidth. So when I'm doing all this manipulation with the atoms, I have to, um, uh, I have to do a load of different things, and those things take time. And you know, typical quantum, not just accelerometer, but other sensor bandwidth is about 1 to 20 hertz. So a typical gravimeter is, is refreshing its atom cloud every second um, so that you can actually um, uh, measure and sample the, the system you want to sample. But if I look at an aviation-grade accelerometer, that's running at hundreds to thousands of hertz. So, um, so I've got a bit of a spec gap there which I need to do something about. So what do I do about that? Well, the, uh, the, the current thinking on that is to use hybrid sensors. It's probably an obvious thing to do. So the thing with the quantum sensor is it basically has zero drift. And so I can use the quantum sensor to calibrate out the drift of the classical sensor. And I've gained the high rate, and I've gained the zero drift. And suddenly I've got now a sensor which is two to three orders of magnitude better than one I can get classically. I'll just pause there, two to three orders of magnitude. That, that's quite disruptive, that's quite game changing. So, what applications has that got? So when you look at global navigation, the, uh, the error rate for something that's in an aircraft, a civil aircraft is usually about one nautical mile an hour. Um, so all, all civil aircraft have got a, an IMU in them because if GPS breaks down, you need to know where you are. Um, and the current the navigation grade ones are about one nautical mile per hour. So a quantum IMU impro improves that by two to three orders of magnitude. So suddenly I can navigate more accurately, almost to the point where I don't actually need GPS. Um, and, and that's the point with um, quantum devices, I might not need uh, satellite navigation. The next thing is, OK, so if I can measure gravity really precisely, what, what can I do with that elsewhere? Um, so remember, um, gravity is just another acceleration, so I can use uh, a, a, a sort of different different type of, but basically the same thing uh, in a gravity meter. Um, and what I can do is I can look for holes in the road. So why would I look for holes in the road? Um, there's about four million holes in the road dug in the wrong place every year. And for anyone who drives a car, you get stuck. And one of the reasons is no one trusts what's down there when I put my JCB into that hole. It might be a power cable, it might be a gas main, it might be a water main. Just I might have maps of what's under the ground, but I don't trust them. Uh, and so people drill small pilot holes, and they try and find out what's 
don't they? Um, so if I have a device that I can now put over the hole and I can now look for uh, the changes in density that a power cable, a gas main, a water main show me, then suddenly I can speed all of that up and I don't have to create as many traffic queues. Um, it then gets quite interesting in that I can do mineral exploration. So people have put these in like planes and they've flown over different areas to explore um, what types of minerals there might be. Um, and then if I get really clever about it, so, so this, is, this is the Potsdam potato, which is the uh, gravity map of the geoid. So this is what the Earth looks if you look at it by gravity. So if you now imagine I get a tiny, tiny resolution portion of this, let's say down to 50 centimetres. So 50 centimetre resolution is the same resolution that I see on a Google satellite image. So if I can get a gravity map down to 50 centimetre resolution, I can actually, with my gravimeter, I can actually navigate by gravity. So as I walk along, I will experience several points of gravity, and when I've got enough of them, my, my navigation device will snap to the point where I am on the Earth's surface, and I'll be able to navigate by gravity. Now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm never going to say that will be the only thing you will navigate with. I'll, I'll never say that. Um, we all use multiple ways of navigating. We use our eyes to see there's a tree over there. You know, Google might not tell us that there's a tree over there, and I might bump, bump my head unless I'm looking. So th there's generally many orthogonal things you use to navigate with. Here's another one. Here's one that can help in circumstances that, um, uh, that you encounter. <clears throat> this is what the gravimeter looks like. So you've got a 19-inch rack, and you've got the thing that has the atom clouds in it. Um, when you look inside that 19-inch rack, um, there's a lot of space in there. So um, that always leads me to think about how to accelerate technologies. So what will happen in three years? First UK manufactured gravimeters. That they're actually in uh, in companies now being created. There's uh, there's at least two companies in the UK that are manufacturing gravimeters, um, and I think in five years, maybe three, maybe five years, the UK will have its first quantum-based inertial navigation system. Remember, I said um, seeing the invisible. This is a technique for seeing around corners. <clears throat> and this is real, I've seen this demonstrated, you can do this, uh, and it's reasonably straightforward actually. So when you look at the camera, just underneath the camera there's actually a laser pointer. And that laser pointer is pointed about here. <clears throat> so the light comes here, it's scattered, the scattering goes all the way around and bounces off this object here. The light bounces back here and then bounces into the field of view of the camera. So that's scattered a few times and bounced around. You can imagine how little light is actually getting back into that camera, a tiny amount of light. What I can do in that camera is I can actually time that light arrival down to the nanosecond. And in that camera, I can count a single photon. So suddenly, I've got a way of range gating the light that's coming back so if I now move that object, I will move, I'll change the relationship of the light that's coming back into the camera. And it's a real-time system. So you can actually do this. I've done this. Um, it's been exhibited for a couple of years now. Um, there are people taking this technology and seeing, seeing what you can actually do with that. But that allows you to see around corners. Um, and that's just a description of it. So other, other imaging, I've, I've talked about gas imaging, um, imaging of molecular signatures, so you can look at chemicals uh, and see how reactions work. Uh, and then we get to communication. So communication is really about communication security. Uh, so the, the first developments of um, 
this technology, which is called quantum key distribution, started in the sort of mid-1980s. Uh, and actually, Cambridge is home to some of that. Toshiba Research Labs are uh, housed in Cambridge University, and they've been working in this area for uh, since the mid-1980s. Um, and that technology has moved ahead. Um, and what is the way of doing is um, we're, we're back to our old friend entanglement. So I get two photons. I entangle them together. I take one photon. I send it down a fiber optic cable. And it gets to the other end. And in the process of doing that, I'm sending a key, just a, a, a standard encryption key. If that photon gets disturbed in that process, that photon changes state. The change of state of this photon, which means when I compare the overall system, it tells me that that key has not arrived securely. So I throw the key away, and I try again. Um, and you can get up to um, several thousands of keys per second now uh, with um, the uh, QKD key exchanges. Um, and I think that is... Uh, so the, the picture show a QKD system from 2007. Um, well that tends to be what they look like. They've got a bit smaller now. Um, and the National Physical Laboratory, again, has a reference system that is used to uh, evaluate people who are selling QKD systems. So where's it been used? So it's been used in a number of places. Uh, it's been used um, in Swiss banks uh, and perhaps other banks as well. Um, it's actually been used for certain Swiss elections when they've been voting. And it's actually used in the FIFA 2010 World Cup. So it, it's starting to be used. Um, what is the future? So the, the York University Hub, which is the one that is pursuing this technology, is working on a number of different aspects of the technology. Um, the, the first and obvious one is to integrate the QKD exchanges over standard telecom lit optical fiber. Um, so that, that technology is moving forward nicely. Um, there's another theme which is using QKD over free space. So you don't have a fiber. The range is shorter. I'll come to another reason why that isn't the case in a minute. Uh, the range is shorter. Uh, but then you can have QKD and you can have handheld QKD devices. Um, there is a UK network of QKD. Um, so um, it started in Cambridge. And uh, the ambition is to get it to Martlesham to Bristol and up to York, um, and reducing the size weight power of QKD devices as well is, is a thing. So the interesting thing is what's happened internationally. So the Chinese launched a satellite in 2016. It was an experimental satellite. Um, it's quite a big one. It was 500 kilograms, so it wasn't a small one. Um, and they had a number of science experiments on there. One of the science experiments was a uh, photon entangler. Uh, and what that enables you to do is the satellite flies over a ground station and then it uses a laser to send an entangled photon and key down to that ground station. The satellite then flies along a bit further and it sends another entangled, sorry, another single photon entangled down there. And then you can use those keys to secure a standard piece of optical fiber. So why would you use a satellite to do that? Uh, it's, it's really quite smart because a satellite, because um, uh, what happens with the tangled photons is they get dispersed as they go down uh, an optic fiber. Uh, noise gets in and, and causes the photons to, uh, to become uh, uh, not as, as pure as they were. Um, but if I do it from space, then I have to get through thin, well, space, which doesn't stop me very much. And then I get through thin and progressively thicker layers of atmosphere until I get down to the ground station. And so you can practically use that technique because you're in space. So uh, roll on a couple of years, and the Chinese um, had a video call between uh, Xinglong in China to Graz in Austria 
protected by keys served by the Missio satellite. Uh, and that woke a lot of people up to what the possibilities were with, uh, with QKD. Uh, so that's really quite interesting. Final area I'm going to cover is uh, computing. So there's a computer there which no one in this room can remember from the 1950s. Um, that required physicists and mathematicians and people to make it work. If you roll forward 30 years, 40 years, who would have imagined from the guys who did that that they would be playing games on a Nokia mobile phone? No one would have thought, for the people who put the ENIAC together, that you would be playing games on a mobile phone using very similar principles to, um, to what the original computer did. So that's my, my challenge, is we probably don't know what quantum computers are going to do in 30 years' time. They will be doing something. There's no question about it. We probably haven't got the imagination at the moment. In 10 years' time, we might get an inkling of what they might do. Um, and we do know some things now of what quantum computers can do for us. So what... I'll come to the applications in a minute. <laughs> so this is a very brief explanation of um, quantum computing. So a classical computer uses an alter or one. I think everyone's very familiar with that, very happy with that. It's called a bit. A quantum computer uses a qubit or a quantum bit. And that has a state of 0 or 1 when you inspect the state. In between, it's in a superposition of states, which can be anything between 0 or 1 simultaneously. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the qubit looks something like that block sphere up there. So it's only when you inspect it that you get an 0 or 1. In between times, it's an auto or a one sometimes, and then almost anything in between. You can also entangle qubits. So you take one qubit, you move another qubit very close to it, and you force entanglement between them. And suddenly you've got a system that has multiple states. So um, it goes two to the power of the number of qubits you've got is the number of states you have in your entire system. So if you have 20 qubits, you can have simultaneously 2 to the 20 states, um, which is quite a large number, but not a massive number. But what you can do with that is that um, when you inspect the calculation you've done, it happens in one go unlike a classical computer system, which is when you're working through the states, you do it sequentially with your uh, semiconductor architecture. So that's very quickly how a, uh, how a quantum computer qubit works. And the important point is they're in superposition, and to get the most out of it, you have to entangle them as well. And this makes the architecture really quite complicated. What can we use them for? So the current thoughts, uh, and these are, these are widely publicized, is um, modeling chemical reactions. So when a chemical reaction propagates, it really becomes very complicated very quickly, far more complicated than a current supercomputer can do quickly. Um, so simulation of chemical reactions. Analogous is drug discovery. So um, how can I look at what a new drug how a new drug might perform in many different uh, body types. Um, so drug discovery. Um, scheduling problems, so the, the, the traveling salesman problem is a, quite a well-known one. If you're, a, um, if you're a truck fleet manager, one of your jobs is to minimize the amount of fuel you use. How do you do that? Well, you maximize the efficiency of the routing of all your trucks. That's actually quite a hard problem. And number four, which is, is probably what people might have come across, is uh, cipher key discovery. So using the 
capabilities of the massively parallelism of the quantum computer to actually uh, decode your inciphered text. So there's a possibility there. Um, the good news is people have thought of this and um, quantum safe encryption schemes have been designed and they're being implemented at the moment. So it, it's not as scary as, as um, everyone might make out. So again, next level of detail down. Um, is it just about qubits? Well, no, it's not. I mean, it, it is. The more qubits you have, the more powerful your machine is, absolutely. Um, but the qubits come with an error rate. So um, they are in a state. But if there is atmospheric noise, if there are vibrations, if there are other molecules or gases near your qubit, they can actually disturb the state. So pretty quickly, you end up with your superposition or entanglement being destroyed. And suddenly, your system of, let's say you had 1,000 qubits and one goes wrong, you've lost your 1,000 qubit entanglement. Uh, and suddenly, that operation of your computer, you have to do again. Um, so getting the error rate down is really important. We've then got the physical properties of the qubits. And again, I haven't put any up here, because there are so many. So you've got trapped ions, um, some of the quantum technologies that I mentioned before. Um, trapped ions, uh, and the ion has to be trapped in a very stable environment, as I've just said. Um, you might want to move it around, so you might have some way of pushing the ion around to go next to something it can be entangled with. Um, there are nitrogen vacancies in diamond, is another way of implementing a qubit. Uh, and the challenge there is replicating the structure efficiently and in a uh, identical manner each time. And Oxford University have been making breakthroughs on that particular, uh, particular challenge. Uh, and then you've got, well, what does a qubit look like? Um, well, it, it, it's got this iron, but to actually trap the iron, you need lasers, some combination of lasers, some RF modulations, and sometimes some acoustic modulation, cooling. When you look at this, this is quite a system to actually put together. So there's been a lot of focus in the last couple of years on, on the architecture and the scalability. Uh, and there are, uh, so, so Oxford has got its Q2020 system, which is again designed to be a computer, not, not to be a single qubit. It's designed to have 20 qubits all inter interconnected so you can actually move the state around. Um, Sussex University has come up with uh, what they call is the blueprint for a quantum computer. You can go and Google that. It's a fascinating piece of technology they actually took up to the city of London and, and demoed in the, in the back, of a, uh, back of a van. Um, so uh, that, that was quite interesting. And then, of course, you've got the software. Well, it might not be called software, but I think people understand. So I have, I've got my piece of hardware, um, and it, it, it's pretty unique at the moment because I designed it. Uh, I now need to be able to use it. And so there's a lot of activity with um, uh, lots of people ranging from the, the large majors through to university researchers through to university spin-offs coming up with different ways of writing software to be used with quantum computers. So what's, what's kind of going on? Um, so we've got um, the National Quantum Information um, Centre. Um, Canada has a company called D-Wave, who people might have come across. Um, they are a computer manufacturer, and actually you, they, they host their computer in the cloud now, so you can actually go and use the computer from, from the cloud. Um, China, um, China again, has invested $10 billion in their National Laboratory for Information Science, which is due to go live in 2020. Massive investment. Uh, I'm sure it'll do very well. Um, UK, we have numerous spin-outs from univers universities all working in quantum computing. And then, of course, we've got IBM, Google, and Intel um, all making statements about um, what they're doing. Uh, IBM, very recently, last, uh, last month, made an announcement about their 20 qubit device. So, activity. Um, 
here are some of the Innovate UK projects. You can go and look this up. It's all in public domain on the web. Um, and here are some of the wide variety of different things that uh, each of those Innovate UK uh, projects is doing. Uh, a lot of the support technology for all of the four uh, quantum, quantum areas. Um, time is moving on, so I'm going to accelerate a little bit so we've got time for questions. Um, so you can see IBM announces the quantum Q system one. Last year, Intel announced the 49-bit, 49-cubic system. Um, China actually has 2,000 kilometers of quantum key distributed fiber. Um, they, uh, you remember I said that they, the distance was limited to about 100 kilometers. They actually have repeaters um, along the fiber to actually make sure it goes all the way down uh, to get from one place to another. So what does developing a quantum product look like? So a lot of it is as you develop a, a standard product. Again, what I said in the, in the beginning, you don't actually have to understand the quantum product itself to be able to develop one. Uh, it helps if you have links with the university and um, some of the very bright PhDs coming out of the Centers for Doctoral Research, um, uh, sorry, the Centers for Doctoral Training. Um, but it is eminently possible to build yourself a quantum product today. Um, you need a market and business case, investment, and I'll comment a bit about technology readiness, supply chain, and skills. N none of that is a surprise to anybody. This is just standard product engineering. Um, so supply chain um, has a... Uh, uh, has actually a market today, and the market today is the 1,000 or so quantum technology laboratories around the world. So the supply chain is busy making and supplying quantum products. And these might be lasers, these might be iron traps, these might be vacuum cells, these might be magnets, these might be control systems that go uh, around all of those. The supply chain is ramping up quickly. Um, there's price pressure to bring down the cost of uh, what is essentially laboratory equipment. So it can be quite bespoke to, to the particular application. So there's, a, there's price pressure to bring that down, and there are technologies that enable you to bring that price pressure down. Uh, there's an element of acceleration going on where companies are seeking to actually get these products uh, uh, moving. Um, and in investment, companies are investing in quantum technology capabilities and skills. Uh, I talk quite a lot to private finance and VCs on um, where they're considering making their investments. So technology readiness, your system components can vary from TRL3 to TRL9. Um, if you remember back to the, um, so TRL is technology readiness level. Um, that was a system that NASA brought into being to measure the technology maturity of things that go on rockets uh, back in the 1960s. And a lot of industry has taken that up. So TRL3 is something that works on a lab bench um, and um, can be then be accelerated into a product. TRL9 is it's a product. I can go and buy it. Um, so I'd say 80% of engineering quantum product is all about miniaturizing what is in a university lab at the moment. Um, it's all about FPGAs. It's all about power supplies, mechanical design, heating, cooling. It's very standard engineering. 20% of it, you really have to understand how the quantum system works to be able to uh, engineer that product to, to do what it needs. So real areas for focus are what we've seen in the UK and what we've actually seen around the world is a tremendous technology push for uh, technologists are developing this cool stuff that now needs to find itself a market. So one of the big challenges is matching business opportunities to quantum technologies. You have to have the commercial vision to see where the quantum technology can actually disrupt the marketplace. 
And the other thing we need to see is an expansion of the supply chain to get those devices cheaper, to get the end products cheaper. So my call to action, <coughs> I've paid part of my taxes. I've invested in the, the industry I like. Uh, however, I would like some of that money back for the UK, for the benefit of the UK. Um, now is a time, as we saw in that diagram there, now is a time where things are five years, ten years away from um, uh, being really quite useful in niche markets. Now is a time to actually take these to market. So, challenge to people in the room, how can your industry take advantage of quantum technology? You've got a choice, three choices. One, you can assess it, decide it's a disruptive uh, to, to the marketplace, embrace it and forge ahead, creating that new technology in that marketplace. And people are doing that. You can also assess it. It is disruptive, but it's not a threat to your market, in which case it's a don't need to do anything. You can also assess it. It is disruptive and it's a threat. And I'm going to have to act upon it. So my conjecture is that you can do one of those three things, but you can't just sit back and ignore it. You have to do one of those three things. So, summary. I've discussed quantum timing, sensing, security, and computing. Uh, I've looked at possible timescales. Um, there's market disruption. And I've talked about how it, what it's like to actually build a quantum technology product. So call to action is let's all go out there and have a think about how quantum technologies could affect your industry, how to exploit quantum technologies. If anybody wants to talk to that, talk about that, come and talk to me. Um, because I know a lot of industries and I know a lot about quantum technologies. Um, and I'd be very welcome to have a conversation with you. Uh, there are some links, um, so you can go and read some really interesting documents. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. <laughs> oh, gentleman in the white shirt. Hello, is it on? Good. It's Mick Ross from the uh, IET Peterman and Huntingdon Local Network. I'd like to ask a question about what's happening at, happening at Nottingham University okay. on quantum sensors. As mm -hmm. I understand it, they now have a portable magne magnoencephalogram, magnetoencephalogram. And uh, the portable one has now got a resolution of four times greater than the, the ordinary magnetoencephalograph. They've mm -hmm. achieved four times the resolution. So the question I'd like to ask is, as they are doing so well up there, and as when you read the transcript of the Science and Technology Select Committee, meeting on quantum technologies back in September, mm -hmm. the minister was pressed uh, about um, how much they would invest in small to medium enterprises. And he said for